uh, today's topic hopefully will be something that you you are probably very familiar with, um, but at the same time there may be some nuggets in there. I have to say there's not a lot that has um, come up a, uh, in the past like you know five seven years. Quite honestly, uh, there may be some some things, and I'll, I'll highlight those. But overall, it's an old disease, and uh, you guys probably know a lot more about this than um, uh, because we see it so often. And hopefully, you'll still find something useful out of this. Really, to start out with, pancreatitis really is a spectrum. And I think it's really important to understand that you have the mild cases, which may not have any clinical symptoms, um, but they do have it. And then you could go all the way to severe when they can actually die. And uh, it's amazing how many of them probably just stay at home, and then they get over it, and, and, uh, and you really may not even see the, the mild cases. And then, then you'll see it maybe for a, a you know, medium or severe case, and then you look back and you ask them the <coughs> history, and a lot of times, oh, yeah, decrease appetite for your days, they get over it, and they keep feeding you know, them in a way that you know, is not ideal for some patients that are predisposed to pancreatitis. I do always tell owners it really is a spectrum. And it can actually move pretty fast. And uh, acute ones, literally 24, 48 hours, um, uh, can really change a patient from able to move about to almost dying. And, uh, and that goes with the same with people, too. Just a good uh, quick review. Uh, so remember, the pancreas has the endocrine section, the islet of Langerhans, and it's really um, just remember bad. Uh, uh, B cells, it makes insulin, the beta cells. A cells, the glucagon, D cells, somatostatin, and exocrine will be ACNR cells that secretes the enzymes and the ductal cells that do the bicarb in water. When you are trying to digest things, carbohydrates are usually di uh, digested by amylase, lipid digestion is lipase, col colipase, and uh, phospholipase. And protein digestion is trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. It has a huge, huge impact on digestion. And then how do you not self-digest yourself? And this is where uh, you have a lot of defenses in autodigestion. And th they are stored as inactive zymogens. And whenever you see the word ogen or pro, usually those are the, the inactive form. So you have trypsinogen, and then you know, the active form would be trypsin. And the pro phospho uh, lipase A2, and the, again, it's a pro word. And then you have the intracellular segregation that the zymogen granules will be kind of separated out um, and so that they can't activate yet. And then you have pancreatic secre uh, secretory trypsin inhibitors. And then you have the plasma protease inhibitors. And that group actually is, is the third largest group of plasma proteins. And those are the alpha macroglobulins, the alpha-1 proteins inhibitor, and the antithrombin, okay? And uh, remember, whenever we kind of give plasma, like people say, do you give plasma to pancreatitis or not? The argument was, well, you know, maybe we'll kind of have some alpha proteins inhibitors in there. Pancreatic secretion, the cholecystokinin, it comes from the eye cells of the duodenum and it stimuli, uh, it, the stimulus is from protein and fat digestion. So I think it's really important that that protein is also a big part too, so it's not just fat. And it could really uh, start to stimulate the digestive enzymes. And it's absorbed into the blood and it stimulates enzyme-rich pancreatic secretion. So sometimes when I have an animal that's really sick, I, I'm also a little bit cautious about super, super high protein. You know? But when they're eating so little, it's like that bite of chicken who you know, really doesn't do much. Um, but, you know, you could definitely mix in the carbohydrates, you know, like pasta and rice. It's easy. And then secretin, it's a source of the S cells in the upper small intestines, and then uh, that will help. Uh, acid is in, in the duodenum, because that's the stimuli, and it's absorbed in the blood, and that's where you will start to stimulate secretion of bicarb-rich fluid. So it really provides its optimal pH for the enzymes. Really, what's happening is that sometimes what you'll see is the intra, uh, pancreatic enzyme activation, you know, is it's failed, the secretory process, and then maybe the lysosome and zymogen granules are starting to fuse early, and then, the, then you often can have a lot of reflux in the duodenal contents. And it really overwhelms the pancreatic secretion, uh, uh, secretory trypsin inhibitors, and then it starts to 
activate other enzymes, and then you have a lot of free radical cell membrane injury, and it really overwhelms the plasma and protonase inhibitors. And really, uh, again, the zymogen stuff, they're really harmless until it kind of gets mixed together. <coughs> and what's interesting, um, I don't feel um, on paper, I guess, they're, they try to look for this. Maybe this is what's happening in some of the pancreatitis, but I guess it's most common in people, but in, and I almost don't do reflux as much. They can other uh, triggers of pancreatitis, you have hormonal imbalances, maybe alter fat uh, metabolism, and then obviously the big one is diabetes mellitus, which comes first. Was it pancreatitis that caused uh, diabetes, or the diabetes is triggering uh, the inability to process fats and overwhelms uh, the pancreas? And then Cushing's disease and the hypothyroidism, again, these are all uh, imbalances in how you deal with fat. And hypercalcemia, I know it's really rare, um, but, but blood calcium can activate stored digestive enzymes. I'm trying to think of, you know, hyperparathyroidism. I don't recall a lot of them coming in. They're just coming in for, you know, a, a PUPD, not typically pancreatized, but at least by definition it can uh, uh, trigger that. And then drugs, there are some sulfur-containing drugs. These are thyroprin. But there's a whole list of drugs, and they really don't know for sure. But, but there are definitely, we know uh, confidently with potassium bromide um, uh, that really can trigger uh, pancreatitis. So if I have a dog that's predisposed, I prefer to not use potassium bromide, um, and, uh, and which can be really tricky because some of the really bad epileptics, they may need a little bit of bromide. So what's interesting is that most people are familiar with dogs with pancreatitis. They're really classic. And, they, you know, they vomit, abdominal pain, and, and, uh, and not feeling great. But cats are just funky because ultimately the majority of them won't want to eat. And they're usually a little bit dehydrated. And now they can start to be a little bit hypothermic, but at least 68%. And vomiting is 35 And I found that's interesting. It's much lower. You know, only a third of cats will vomit. And it's the majority of them don't. And then abdominal pain, because they're just too tough, they're not going to show it. So I guess it's kind of hard to assess, but a lot of times um, they're, they're pretty soft belly. And, um, and then the, the, sometimes you can feel like a mass on palpation, dysmic, ataxic, and diarrhea. But again, these are minor, but I feel like the classic dog, vomiting, abdominal pain is so straightforward. And cats, they just really just decrease appetite. So the, because these signs are so vague, this is where it's really challenging, because it's not very obvious that they have pancreatitis and that should be on, a, on a, a differential list. The diagnosis of pancreatitis, you look at the history and signalment, the CBC, you know, chemistry, and then I really don't use amylase lipase at all, and I think most labs now, they don't even have it on there, but occasionally there are some. I mean, it's fine, it's in there, but it's really high, great, but just don't, don't really put too much weight on it, I would say, because it, it, because it's so nonspecific. There's so many other um, organ systems that secrete that, um, and then it really has an impact when you're dehydrated, because remember the GFR is, goes down, and that's how you clear the amylase lipase, so it'll be really high just because you're dehydrated. And then for cats, it's all over the place. So even, you know, don't even look at it for cats at all. And, and I know in humans, there's still amylase lipase, you know. Um, so I do feel that um, a lot of, like, human physicians will ask about that. And um, I do find that uh, we'll go over, you know, this, this is more of the common test that people are, are really running now. The CPLI, doesn't matter if you go to Texas A&M or IDEX, and then FPLI, and then Precision PSL from Antec. Okay. And then radiographs and ultrasound can also be quite helpful. So the history, um, really, I try to look at dietary indiscretion, um, any drugs, and then and trauma. Occasionally you will get the uh, traumatic hit by car that is having a hard time recovering, and you find out they actually have pancreatitis. Infection, uh, toxoplasma is a big one. Uh, occasionally you get the liver flu flukes, FIP, Khaleesi virus. Those are all things that have been identified with pancreatitis. And then, of course, if you're in Trinidad and you get bit by some scorpion, I know there's supposed to be some Trinidadian scorpion that caused pancreatitis, so that should be on your differential. You ask that if they've been to Trinidad with their cat. Um, and then recent surgery. Specific causes are not apparent in cats. That's the frustrating part. We really don't have a link. It just happens. And often it has um, concurrent disease involving the liver or small intestine. So we see a lot of inflammatory bowel disease uh, in cats, and uh, I do think that it's probably more adjacent organ system, and they're all kind of the triaditis. They all kind of like talk to each other. They start to become inflamed together. 
And the, what's interesting is that really you can have signs even from less than three days to like 12 weeks. So cats are just this like, oh, poor doer. And those are the frustrating ones actually, the chronic ones that are just like, how do I get over that hump? You know, and, and you can never get through it. And then I find that some of them, if I really treat for inflammatory bowel disease, if I actually diagnose or something else, I feel like it's a little bit easier to deal with the pancreatitis. Uh, but then some of them are just poor doers, and I have a feeding tube in them, and I'm treating for inflammatory bowel disease. It just kind of like, just kind of hang in there, but you could tell they don't feel good. And there's definitely obviously breeds that you're, you're very familiar with all the hyperlipidemic uh, dogs or hypercholesterolemic. You know, there's like primary form. There's remember triglyceride versus cholesterol. They're two different things. So if you have that layer of fat, that is going to be triglycerides. And then cholesterol could be super high, and you don't have to have that layer of fat. And then sometimes you have a combo. And then a lot of times the small dogs, and then uh, and then maybe a Siamese and Himalayans are also a little bit higher risk in cats. And I find obese animals, and who knows? Is it because there's just so much fat, or what are they eating to get so fat? You know, so who knows? And then uh, endocrine uh, disorders, so Cushing, diabetes, hypothyroidism, and then again I talked about hyperlipidemia, the cholesterolemic ones, or the triglyceridemic ones. And then hypercalcemia, again, that's, that's a lot of papers will say that, and there's been like some, some association, but I don't see that as, as practical uh, for the cases I see with hypercalcemia. So uh, associated is definitely cholangio hep, and, uh, and <clears throat> that's, again, it's because the bile duct merges with the pancreatic duct in the cat compared to the dog and the humans. Inflammatory bowel disease, um, and they can also have low B12 then. Um, with this, so it's never wrong to run a B12, and they're like, ooh, you also have low B12, and they may need to be supplemented. But that, if I have a low B12 and I have a pancreatitis case, I don't run B12 on all my pancreatitis, and it's just straightforward, but if there's a weight loss, there's a potential primary GI, I think it's something that it, it leads me toward, you probably have something else going on intestinally. And remember where low B12, what, what, what's, what part of the GI tract is affected? So it's what part of the small intestine? So the ileum. So, so this is a tricky part. When I have a vomiting cat not eating, I go upper GI, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna touch the ileum. So now a lot of arguments are people wanna do both upper and lower, but sometimes it just takes more time to kind of clean out the colon and such. Um, but <clears throat> at least that tells me a little bit there's an ileal absorption. And then hepatic lipidosis, um, again, uh, it's interesting because about 40% of fatty liver cats do have pancreatitis. And they're often overweight, and there's a coagulopathy, because remember the uh, biliary uh, congestion, and a lot of your co uh, coagulation cascade has to go through the biliary tract, you know, the, uh, the vitamin K family. Uh, so that's where a lot of these guys, they do need to be supplemented, sometimes a little bit of sub-Q vitamin K. And then you can have peritoneal uh, effusion too. So if you have a pancreatitis case, I'll, I'll see that there'll be free fluid, and you have that bright fatty liver on ultrasound. So this is just an image of the bile duct coming down, and then you have the pancreatic duct. They share into one opening, and this is what's so tricky versus the dog and humans will have its two separate openings. And you can imagine any little inflammation can really kind of cause a little obstruction or, or partial, and then, then it, the bile just kind of gets congested pretty, pretty heavily. The... CBC is highly variable, okay? So you could definitely have the left shift with, with dogs, but less so in cats. Mild anemia uh, can be sometimes non-regenerative in, in uh, cats, but occasionally we will also see it increase because they're usually pretty dehydrated. And then occasionally we will see thrombocytopenia when it's really severe because you're like going toward the DIC range and such. Pink, uh, the biochemistry, so uh, you have a lot of pre-renal and renal. And this is where you really need to always get a urine specific gravity. You have that one window of time to collect that urine, even if it's a tiny drop, just so that you can know is there a concurrent renal. So many re uh, cats have renal disease, and once you start fluids, you don't know what the renal status is. And I've seen pretty severe pre-renals that you can really correct once they get hydrated um, and they're not renal failure because you don't want to give a negative prognosis when, when it's really just pre-renal. So liver enzymes are going to be quite high, hyperbilirubinemia, and a lot of times we will see a little bit of hyperglycemia. I feel like I have a dog that's really sick and I see the glucose a little bit high because they don't get the stress hyperglycemia in dogs. So I start to go, hmm, I wonder if you have pancreatitis. You know, that's making you feel sick. 
And, um, <clears throat> but then if you start to see hypo, then that's bad because then you worry about sepsis, endotoxicemia, um, and you're really decompensating. We'll often see the low albumin um, because of the vasculitis. When they start to have infusion, they'll start to leak out a lot of the protein. And it's not from liver failure, even though your bilirubin's high. That takes time for you to stop producing albumin. There's a lot of reserve, so there's usually a leaky uh, vessel issue. And the hypocalcemia, of course, is uh, oftentimes with the low calcium, with the al low albumin, but sometimes it's because it's kind of getting saponification in the fat, so they kind of deposit the calcium uh, speckles in the pancreas. And some of it's going to change the PTH homostasis, about 50% of the cats. And there is a, a variable alteration, depends on how much they're vomiting. So your, your sodium, potassium, chloride can be a little bit off, and a lot of times they're not eating and they get really depleted, and those are the situations where you really need to have potassium supplementation, even if it looks normal. You know, once you hydrate and such, sometimes they're going to use up the reserve when they start to shift because they could be pretty acidotic too. Like they're really, really sick. And, they, and then you have the hypercholesterolemia that in cats more because of that biliary duct and the pancreatic duct merging. Unless, like, you have a cushing noy dog or a diabetic, of course. Your analysis, we kind of talked about the it's so critical to get that window of time to uh, appreciate it's a pre-renal. And you can have a, a transient proteinuria. Um, and then you just want to make sure there's not a pyelonephritis that's causing abdominal pain because um, pancreatitis and uh, kidney pain, they all kind of look, and back pain, they all kind of look same, similar. And then, uh, of course, if you see glucose or proteinuria, uh, you're worried about this is going to be... Um, uh, you know, a diabetic now. And in cats, uh, remember, they could be transient. And then in dogs, I had one uh, was transient. It was like for like four days in the hospital. I'm like, oh, you need insulin. And it was one of those things. I don't know how Dr. Kalfi got it for like surgery. And, and then I was like, oh, you're crazy. It's, 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 of course, it's diabetic. And then he goes, well, it wasn't, you know, a few days ago. And I'm like, once a dog is permanent diabetic, it's, that's it. And then, and then, of course, I, he did something, I think, to that dog. And ultimately, the sugar normalized. So I don't know how, because they needed like three days of insulin, and then it calmed down, and then he didn't have to go home on insulin, which is really unusual for me. Uh, and then just remember, if you have glucose in the urine, you can still be stressed, okay? There's a time, I remember they learned that, oh, that's how you differentiate between stress versus diabetic. No, cats can be so stressed that they can't have spillover of glucose. If you're really not sure, you can always run a fructosamine. You're like, how long has it been going on? Do I really need to start insulin? And I just have to be very careful with uh, uh, insulin therapy and a really active pancreatitis cat one, because I do find that fluid therapy will help them out a lot, and the sugars can come out down nicely and um, they don't need as much insulin as a only diabetic, brand new. Amyloid lipase, if they're not very specific, you can definitely have intestinal disease, corticosteroid uh, administration, um, uh, can release lipase and renal disease. Both enzymes will go up from GFR decreasing, and, <clears throat> and there's all these like, other types of lipase, you know, fat cells, liver cells, intestinal cells. And then you can see all the range all over the place, you know, for um, confirmed pancreatitis and what, if it's normal. Six, 28 to 61%, you know, that's pretty high. So, and then um, 31 to 47, and then they were talking about sensitivity and specificity for both. And then you have the pancreatic lipase immunoreactivity. Um, this is a ELISA to measure pancreatic lipase, so it's very specific to the pancreas. So you'll have a few papers, and they're, they're kind of all over, but the overall the sensitivity is pretty good at 96% and specificity at 82 But I think it's really important to know that is it a mild case, moderate case, or severe? You know, if you start to pull those papers out, those are tricky. And when you have these, like, big studies, they don't really say these are all the mild, and then I'm going to run a sensitivity specificity, and these are all the moderate. And what is considered moderate? What's your gold standard? Unfortunately, who's getting biopsies of these pancreases? You know, so I think that's where I find it very challenging when you have to interpret these papers with a little grain of salt, like what is your gold standard? But I thought that's just kind of an interesting uh, look because mild cases, maybe it's only 21% would be picked up, you know. And then the moderate, hopefully, obviously, the, the worse it is, it's going to be more obvious. And then uh, cats, is a little bit even trickier, the FPLI, but really we don't have anything great out in the market. And so the FPLI, I think the sensitivity is maybe 70%, um, and then maybe specific, uh, specificity is 83 
So the sensitivity is 70% and specificity is 83. Uh, so it's kind of similar for the specificity with the TLI, but again, just realize, you know, you could lose 30% of your cases, right, if you're thinking around 70% that truly have it, but you're not able to detect it. So you really have to look at the whole picture. And, but the nice thing about it is not affected by renal disease, and that's where a huge, huge um, improvement on, on this type of test. And, but like PMA hemolysis can. So this is where it's tricky. If you have a really, really fatty um, spin down, occasionally they have to like really kind of clarify it. I know IDEX does like a double spin and they do things to it to get rid of the lipemia. And then, and then I always worry that if you do pull blood and you're sending it out and it's not going to go out till tomorrow, make sure the people are spinning it down and separate it before you submit it because a lot of times you can get a lot of artifactual things too. And then you have the SNAP, you know, and that's uh, it's pretty strongly correlated. But again, I find that sometimes if it's like a moderate case, you're probably going to be a positive or, or a severe case. But you have that gray zone one that I, I feel like is not going to it's not going to be able to pick it up. And if you notice, there's nothing 100%, okay? But I like this. I don't use it much for internal medicine because most of the time they're already kind of referring to me or getting transferred to me. I'm going to treat it as a pancreatitis, so I kind of want a quantitative number. But I can imagine on the ER they use it a lot because it's like, do I go to cut for surgery? Is it a foreign body, you know, or is it going to be pancreatitis? Um, and, and if it's like a negative, it helps me. Like, all right, you better start looking for something else potentially uh, if you're that sick. You know, and a calandro hep is another good one. Like, wow, your liver enzymes are crazy high and your bilirubin's high and your snap is negative. That makes me start to look like you better not be a mucosal, you better not be a, a obstruction or a mass, um, you know, a leptospirosis. Those are all things that can be helpful. So I think it does, um, especially if you don't, because we're lucky to, well, even IDEX, we still have to send it out and get it in the next day, but still sometimes you're in a situation I want to make that decision now. And I think it's really important that just because it's a negative test, you can't be 100% it's not pancreatitis. But again, look at the whole picture. If you have a really severe case, it is unusual to be negative, though, I have to say. I don't know, if everything kind of fits. The pancreas looks ugly on the ultrasound, free fluid, everything fits. So now the IDEX, uh, the, uh, that original test is all from Texas A&M, and then I think they sold it to IDEX. So now they renamed it for the SPEC PLI. Um, and... <clears throat> they uh, are very specific to the pancreatic lipase. So, so this test, uh, again, the, they have a different sensitivity, so, so at 83%. So the original paper was like from a Texas A&M when it came out, and then now this is the IDEX one. And so I'm like, oh, the specificity is much, you know, pretty good, but the sensitivity, you're 83, which is not bad, right? But you just have to think about some cases when we miss. And cats, maybe 80%, and the specificity is maybe 82. And then there's precision and PSL. And this one, it, it, they feel like it has a very close agreement with a, spec, a CPL. Okay, so this is a crazy long name, so they call it DGGR. And lipase um, assay. And, but if you look on these kind of papers, you know, you look at what is the gold standard. So the original Texas AM, they did do biopsies. So it's like, great, you know, that's, that helps me. And then, but then the, later on it starts going, all right, because this is a gold standard and this is a normal, then they start to compare it to this, the, the, the assay itself. And, and that's what this is doing. You know, the, the precision PSLs is, is comparing it to the other assay. But then if you start to use your gold standard and then this is the, the sensitivity of it, and then, it's, then you do another test to kind of match that one, you're going to get farther and farther away from the gold standard a little bit. So... Just be, be careful of that. But again, at least they did look at ultrasound and it was suspected pancreatitis, but ultrasound you'll learn later on that it's not also 100% either. So these are just not um, perfect, but it is what it is because it's hard to just recommend surgery on these guys. So trypsin-like immunoreactivity, so this is great for EPI. So sometimes you're, you stumble on this when it's super high because you're actually looking for a diarrhea case, and you're like, ooh, TLI is really high, but sometimes it can be actually from pancreatitis because we do know intestinal disease is associated with pancreatitis. But if it's low, obviously, you, you have your diagnosis of EPI. But if it's high, it probably suggests there is some kind of uh, reactivity in, in, from the pancreatitis. But not all, so sensitivity is even worse. It's at 37.5. And so we don't use that anymore. There was a time that because the FPLI was not present, people were using TLI for your pancreatitis case in cats because we knew amylase lipase was horrible. But even that, um, 
it, it's not great. Uh, and it definitely gets affected by renal disease. And we see a huge increase in IBDs and GI lymphoma cases, even though the normal uh, pancreatic histology. So you know, I have a paper that says, hey, we actually did histopath. It helps me to understand what their normal, um, what their gold standard was. So radiographs, it's really going to often be absent until you have a more severe case, but I think obviously you're trying to rule out foreign body, especially in a dog, so I don't think it's, it's wrong to ever do radiographs. Um, but sometimes you will look for a loss of seroso detail, the passive in the right cranial quadrant, uh, but really I've seen it also just in the cranial quadrant in general, and then you often will see displacement of the duodenum ventrally in, 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 or to the right. You, you definitely can see this hypomodal duodenum, and you have a caudal displacement of the transverse. Just think of where the pancreas lay, lies and just imagine it's super swollen. And sometimes they look like mass-like. Like on ultrasound, it's impressive. They're like so, so chunky that it really does look like mass-like. Unfortunately, it could be normal, uh, but you are looking for like pleural effusion and you kind of get a little bit of a uh, chest in there. A lot of times we'll kind of say, oh yeah, pancreatitis, but wow, look at that pleural effusion. And um, I really like when you do the VD, I look at the... Um, Costophrenic junction, that's a great place to see for fluid, just a hint. It would be like a smooth round versus you should have a nice tapering in the black lungs, you know. So that's a great little tip for the pleural fusions on, on VD. And, uh, and you definitely have a really bad case. You can get um, edema, you know, the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema or pneumonitis in a social pattern. It's a little bit heavier and it does go away because <clears throat> it's almost like SIRS, severe inflammatory response, and then now your whole body is become inflamed. So you get pretty bad vasculitis. Ultrasound, I feel like this is really um, operator dependent, machine dependent. And so sensitivity can be up to 68%. And, and cats, a little bit trickier, but it can um, be up to 67%, but as bad as 35 And these are all just different um, studies that kind of looked at ultrasound. Uh, and the specificity is not bad, uh, for sure. But I just think that uh, it's, it's great when you see it but you can never rule it out, you know, if it's normal. I just get so much out of an ultrasound anyway because you're looking for biliary obstruction and, and duct dilation, peritoneal fluid. So and a lot of times I'm trying to get prognosis for the owner. So are you going to spend all this money on this animal that has necrotizing pancreatitis because you have to be in it to win it, you know. You're talking about in the hospital for five to seven days, if not more, uh, versus one that doesn't have any infusion. Because once you have the abdominal infusion, that's really scary. And the next thing you know, they're going to have to go into respiratory distress. You know, they usually start to get pleural effusion or, or they're vascularizing their lungs and they die from respiratory arrest, not just from the pancreatitis. And then I think it's really important to look at pancreatic masses and also sometimes uh, uh, even like abscesses. And pancreatic masses are interesting. Sometimes I see a really ugly pancreas that looks just like pancreatitis, but the dog's not painful. You know, liver enzymes are high, but you're not painful. You're not really vomiting, um, and, and then I'll run a PLI, and it'll be normal, but then you have your fusion, and, and usually those are I worry about pancreatic carcinoma. They don't have to have active pancreatitis at all. You just have an ugly pancreatic mass. And this is just like some old, it's pretty not the best images, but just uh, how, how edematous, um, the surgery. And look at I'm sure you guys all probably have seen ugly pancreases more so than myself, so... Uh, and then, really, to diagnose it, you need the gold standard is biopsy. But the reality is that do we ever do that? And, and remember, they could be multifocal. You know, just like intestinal disease, I don't just go in and just get one little sample when I do scoping. I'm going to get like 20 to 30 on the stomach and maybe like 20, 15 to 20 on the uh, duodenum. And um, you would hope your surgeon's not like sitting there making like Swiss cheese out of, you know, your pancreas. I'll be like, ah! But, um, but they try to find an easy area, but I do find that some of the even issues with gold standard being pancreas, unless you do it on necropsy, you know, where you're really going to get different slices. So, um, but it's really rare that we ever have to do that. I've, I, I mean, occasionally we're just trying to figure out if it's a mass or not, if something's not fitting, and then we may go in. The histologic diagnosis, if you do get a chunk, it's, you know, necrotizing, uh, uh, pancreatitis. Those are really ugly. And then you can have the acute separative. That's mostly neutrophils. That's probably the more common one we see. And then the non-separative. It's like the lymphocytic, uh, plasmacytic, and fibrosis. The real question is, is this just a spectrum going this way? You know, it's not just like two individual, you know, three different individual histopath, but really it is a spectrum potentially. You know, you may start out there, and then it's getting pissy, and then now tissue are starting to die, so you get the neutrophils are coming in, and next you know you have dead tissue. So 
who knows. So let's talk about treatment. So the treatment for pancreatitis, you know, do you rest the pancreas? I mean, that's kind of like what we were taught a long time ago, and now we're like, no, feed, feed the, um, you know, the gut at least. Um, but I still, like, I have a hard time when the animal's vomiting. I'm like, oh, kind of try to shove something. I'm like, just let it, you know, fast for 12 hours and just try a little tiny bite. I still like to feed, but just very carefully, you know, and uh, but not, like, truly, like, fast forever. And then IV fluid support, colloids. And then the question is, you know, antibiotics, pain management, and antibiotics. So we'll kind of break it down, okay? I do think fluid therapy is just really important. If the owner won't hospitalize a patient, at least minimally give us a sub-Q fluid. They may have to come in daily, whatever, because you really want to try to avoid that ischemic injury because they're really having poor perfusion because they're really dehydrated. They're really not going to eat or drink typically. And if they do, they may just vomit it up. And then uh, just be very careful. You're on IV fluid support, not to overload them because their albumin is quite low. So um, they can start to and they get vasculitis, and then they're kind of leaky, and next you know they're seeping everywhere. And then I like to supplement with potassium because they're not eating, and usually they're not going to eat for a few days. It's always safe to kind of add a little potassium to their fluids. It can also become low again when they're acidotic. So that potassium and hydrogen ion shift the proton ship. And then important to monitor, uh, especially um, uh, if it's uh, diabetic. Okay, I can't tell you how many pancreatitis cases, DKA, people look at the potassium, it's like even 3.9. You're like, oh, don't worry about it. It's going to come down once you start insulin. You know, that insulin's going to pull that potassium in and now you're really depleted. So most of my diabetic DKAs with pancreatitis or, you know, just DKA in general, they're probably on 40 to 60 milliequivalents per liter. And then I've done... Um, one time, it was like 180. It was just so like, uh, you know, but you just have to watch the fluid rate, obviously, because you don't want to um, have a higher risk of, uh, of cardiogenic issues when potassium so high uh, in their fluid concentration. But you'd be surprised. They just need a lot. And then col colloid, you know, do you give plasma? So, again, the argument is maybe alpha macroglobulins. It's kind of coming out of fat. It comes in fat, out of fat. Um, I think that I used to, if I have a really severe case, I'll definitely do some plasma, but our criticalist says, oh, don't do it, no one does them anymore, and then, and then it just varies. And I have another criticalist that said, hey, you know, yeah, you can. So I think it's all over the map. I feel that when we're really desperate, you have that acute necrotizing pancreatitis, they're starting to fuse, you really want some colloid help. I'm not using the plasma for the true colloid, though. I just don't want to, I'm using more for alpha uh, macroglobulins, because if I really want that colloid support, I'll be using that starch or, you know, head of starch. Um, or if the albumin is so low, I'll be giving a, a human, I mean, canine albumin transfusion. Because um, I'm definitely not, it's just too wimpy for colloid support for plasma. But it does have some uh, albumin, but it's really not as effective as that starch or head of starch. So it does help bind detergents, uh, the free fatty acids. So ultimately, I think plasma is, can be helpful, but is it going to make or break them? Who knows? And I think plasma also is really helpful because it does help with DIC. And then they're about to go into it. My argument is like, well, then plasma is definitely going to help with that. So, but maybe we're not there yet, but, and you're going to go in it. So I, that's my, my thought when they're super severe. Head of starch, again, I'm using it more for uh, oncotic pressure because you'll notice that if you are blasting with crystalloids, you start to get all edematous and they're really uncomfortable and you can't, you can't over, you know, easily overload them. So I will have to kind of reduce my fluid uh, crystalloids so I can uh, at least do vet starch. Um, and you especially will, will um, be helpful for cardio, uh, cardiac cases. They just can't handle too much. Uh, but remember, it doesn't pertain any of the protease inhibitors. And some people, it can aggravate bleeding tendencies. And maybe it can help with microcirculation with antithrombotic effects. But there was, like, some studies that showed that uh, even when you use uh, uh, head starch, they're, they're actually worse. They die. But then those are the population that you're kind of going to die anyway. So those are hard to say. But at least that's women in humans. Are you using much of that if you're concerned if they have either renal or pre-renal the whole sphere about head starch and I don't, I still don't, not dramatically, you know, because it depends on if I have to blast them with crystal and you're getting infusion, I'm sure that that's not going to help your renal, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah exactly. So, so sometimes I just really want to watch my volume, and that's the, the thing. So I, I do not. You say that you're monitoring all these things. 
on what kind of frequency or schedule, like your potassium? Are you doing it twice a day, three times a day? I think it depends on how low it is. If it's definitely low, and especially my diabetic, at least it's every 8 to 12 hours. Um, I start to, you know... You come out of your residency, you're like, oh my gosh, I'll do it every four hours. And then, you know, but then it's like, all right, that's silly. And then you start to be very practical. And so I feel like if your potassium is truly low, I think every eight to 12 hours is reasonable. And then you start to back away to maybe just once a day to make sure you're checking something to you're on the right track. And then I stop, you know. And then, um, but, but I do think potassium could be a tricky one that people don't realize how low it's going if you don't check it again because you came in normal. That's the ones that I feel like is challenging, especially if they're just not eating a lot and you're really not putting that feeding tube yet and you're like, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and then their potassium is getting depleted. So do you do antibiotics or not? So remember, pancreatitis is a sterile process, okay, uh, as, a, as opposed to humans. Uh, but I do have to say cats are just funky because they get kind of hep. They get, you know, the whole bile duct, the gut, they're all kind of shared in the same area. I feel like they uh, they can have more issues. But in general, they're so decompensating. A lot of times I have diarrhea. I have a lot of GI issues with my patients that are just so sick, and I do get a lot of translocation of bacteria. So I will uh, put them on pro, uh, um, broad spectrum antibiotics, you know, um, and but I just want to stress that sometimes you're like, oh, he has a fever. That's why I'm putting antibiotics. Not necessarily because you could have a sterile pancreatitis. You have fever, you know. Um, it's not necessarily uh, necessary from infection because sometimes I've seen people like, I'm already on Unison. I'm already on Batril. You know, I'm still freaking out. And I'm going to add more and more, but let the pancreas calm, and eventually that fever will go away. So there's a reason. It bothers me when I have a fever and I can't find a cause, you know. So, and then, of course, diabetes, they're already immune compromised, so, so this is one where you want to make sure that their sugars are pretty well regulated, you want, because, the, you know, the super high sugar is not going to be good for recovery, for sure. So I'm a huge fan of diabetes, you know, definitely CRI insulin, because you can really tailor the glucose. My goal, if it's in the hospital, they should be in the 100s for their blood sugars, you know, when they're in the hospital. And that's the easiest to control when you have a, a crashing diabetic, because I could literally adjust the CRI insulin um, uh, accordingly by fluid rate, you know, versus you go into long acting, those are just all over the place because they're really decompensated. And uh, we're, we're huge, though. We tend to do unison a lot. And if I have one, remember, unison is a, a ampicillin plus sulbactam, so it pen- p- potentiates that ampicillin. It's a beta-lactamase inhibitor, so very similar to IV and clavamox. But uh, if I have a really like strong gram neg- uh, E. coli family, a gram negative concern, um, I will add in Batril too on top because Unison's great for even um, E. coli, but not as strong as for quinolones, especially in a very harsh environment that's very purulent, for example, um, like a like a pancreatic abscess. Because um, just like for the same reason why we use fluoroquinolones for uh, prostatitis, you know, infections, because it really is a harsh environment. Some antibiotics, it can fit, and it looks like it should get it, but then it can't survive that uh, really nasty, purulent environment. Remember the anatomy for the pancreas, and this is why the colon runs right adjacent to that. So there's a lot of inflammation that's so severe. I would do see more permeability issues, and that's why the translocation of bacteria can happen. Pain management. It's going to be really important, obviously, to keep them comfortable. Butorphanol, buprenorphine, and uh, then you have the pure agonist. And a lot of, like, criticalists, they kind of like the pure stuff versus the mixed. But ultimately, you just have to kind of use your judgment and how, how, how painful they are um, where we try to palpate, you know, and we have, like, a pain score from all our ICU patients and then when they're kind of checking them out to make sure that... They are very comfortable, and our nursing staff is great, and they'll let us know when they feel like they're, you know, we're not doing it, you know, when we're just using butorphanol. That's really short acting. It's kind of wimpy, uh, so some of them will go a little bit longer, but really a good one that we used to always do, but now we use um, a methadone, you know, is a good one. But, but the, uh, I forgot to add that one in. But lidocaine, ketamine, CRI drip is another great one, too. Anti-emetic, anti-nausea. I'm a huge fan of Reglan in fluid because there's just so much ileus going on. You know, I'm not I'm not using it for the anti-emetic effects, but it's a bonus. But I think uh, I love CRI uh, medical bromide in all my pancreatitis cases. I feel like they because um, even if you want them to start eating, and your stomach is just not emptying. They just feel more nauseous, and then it's eventually going to come out. And 
I feel metoclopramide is great. But remember, if you are going to send it home or do oral, I see a lot of people only do it like twice a day. This is a very uh, short uh, half-life uh, when you take it orally. So you have to give it at least every four to six hours if you really want to give it to mean it. But most people can't do that from a schedule standpoint, so at least every eight. But I feel that um, it's one that I was right every eight hours, but it can increase up to every four to six hours if needed, you know, for vomiting, decreased appetite, and such. And then you have Zofran, at least now it's generic, so it's much more reasonable in cost. And, uh, and there's some Dilancitron, but ultimately we use Serenia quite a bit. And now there's always like magical powers of Serenia, there's like anti-cramping, it, it you know, makes you know, back dogs walk again, I don't know, I do just like crazy stuff. So if you guys invest in stock, I should have done it, but um, it is one where um, I think it, it does quite a lot, especially with um, cramping and such. And remember, they have the 160, so sometimes I will have a big dog. I could use a you know, quarter of a 160 or uh, versus like having like three tablets of the small ones. Um, so I do like the 160s a lot. Anti-acid secretion drugs. You know, maybe it helps with reflux esophagitis, especially when they're so bloated. The fluid is kind of like, you know, they're doing reflux all the time, and, you know, uh, and some of the eventually will come up. So I do feel like it can be helpful. Um, I think that we are in a situation where we tend to treat probably esophagitis and reflux probably more often than we really need to. I think it's one of those things in vet school I remember like immediately, back then it was not pentoprazole, it was uh, famotidine. It's like everyone gets famotidine. Then now you're like, why? And, and then usually it's one where we probably overdo it, but ultimately um, if you are concerned about reflux or just that nausea feeling and it, it is kind of going up, you, uh, we like omiprazole because you want to get rid of the pump altogether. So remember, all the other H2 blocker, it only just does H2. Because remember, the proton pump, remember, has like three receptors. So you have the H2, right? And that's your histamine 2. And then you, and, and that's why like for mast cell tumors, you want a histamine 1 block too. So that's why you do the um, H1, H2, which, you know, blockers. But then the, um, then the other one is gastrin. You can't do anything about that. Gastrin is still going to be secreted, and that's why I'd rather just knock out the pump, and that's why omiprazole works much better than just a pure H2 blocker. And then, then remember the third receptor is acetylcholine, which you can't do much about that either. Okay, so this is why omiprazole it has, definitely has shown that it is stronger, in looking at the pH in several different studies, that it's more effective. We, you can go up to twice a day if it's really, you know, you want to give it to mean it because there's some concern about ulceration or something like that. And there used to be a time that you can't split it. You're supposed to not give it whole, but a new study came out that you totally can split it. So, um, and they come in 20 milligram tablets. The nice thing about it is there's a pretty huge range. You could go to like one make per kig, you know, so, so therefore the average cat can easily take a quarter tablet. And it's hard to overdose, you know, it's not one of those things. So you can try to do a quarter tablet. Um, there used to be um, uh, the capsule that were omiprazole that they have little pellets in it. They're little capsules. And those are pretty cool because you could open them up and each little, you count the beads and you could really. So if you're doing that, the only downside is um, you're supposed to put it in bicarb. Uh, I remember learning, I don't know if you still have to do that, but I remember our uh, pharmacist at Ohio State, because um, we used to get, um, you know, gastronoma, it's like pretty rare, but you get it in cats and such. And, um, and was, I had a gastronoma case, and ultimately um, uh, we would open up the capsule, and then she would put bicarb and, and mix it for that concentration, because it has to be bicarb to be stable. When you can't just pop it in the cat's mouth or something. And um, so she would make it up for us. But now the nice thing about compounding pharmacies is everywhere. So you really have to kind of, you have these little tiny, like, three <coughs> cats or something. I'm sure you can make it. The pharmacist should be able to know to what kind of formulation. Because sometimes it is pH dependent on the stability. Okay, nutrition. Typically, uh, in dogs, are they really MPO? We really shouldn't be MPOing them, but they're kind of naturally doing that. By the time they come to you, they've probably not been eating for one or two days. Uh, one to three days or so. Um, I do try to tell owners, try to um, uh, offer water at least and then, and then you know, add, add a little bit more, more food. But ultimately, um, you're really going to have to 
put a uh, feeding tube in. And, and now that uh, we have a critic list, I, I notice that they do that uh, almost automatically, pretty quickly, which is great because I never thought about it. I'm like, yeah, because they do have a lot of ileus and some of just fluid filled. When we ultrasound, there's just a lot of ileus. You just want to get rid of that just so that you can suction that out. And then, and then it's great to have access because now you have a trickle feeding system that you could start to give a little nutrition as long as they're not vomiting. So I do think an NG tube is really reasonable, but the downside is NG tube really should be hospitalized. Okay, you try to send an NG tube in an animal, they're just going to like mess with it and the owner's going to be calling you to try to sort that out. Um, but we're fairly pretty aggressive uh, with NG tube from the hospital. Now, uh, cats, I, if I have a bad pancreatitis, I usually give the talk that you really need a feeding tube because it could take days to weeks. And if you're not eating, I'm trying to avoid fatty liver, and sometimes I already have fatty liver, and I, I really am putting them in very quickly. I used to, as a, a resident, uh, I was always a peg tube person. And, and then now looking back, it's like, we totally should have done e tubes because it's just a little bit, uh, very cost effective, uh, super easy in a sense that if it really comes out, the cat doesn't die versus like when you have that peg tube placement, you know, if you have to have a mature stoma in about 14 days and then if they do something crazy, um, it, it really is scary. And um, <clears throat> so now e tube is definitely the way to go, I feel. And the uh, nasal ga gastric tube, you can, but ultimately your cat's going to try to send them home as fast as you can because they're not going to like do anything in the hospital or eat and, and such naturally when they're not feeling well. So I feel like the NG tube in a cat, I say spend the money and just putting an E tube. You know, it's, it's, if you're, you're going to be committed in the, with the NG tube, you're going to be in there at least three to seven days you know, in the hospital. And uh, in J2, there was a time that, you know, you, you think about, oh, do I need to uh, put a J tube in? And, and people were bypassing the stomach. But there's actually a lot of studies that they say that the secretion, because that's what the whole point was. Why do you MPO? You're going to stimulate the, you're gonna stimulate the pancreas and the enzymes are going to get more pissed off. Uh, they did studies. That actually, they feel like your, your system is so out of whack, you're not even secreting properly anymore. You know, because you ever kind of release some of the enzymes and you're doing your own thing. So it's not triggered by food anymore. And I do think that uh, with enteral support, it really probably decreases the, the, the systemic inflammatory response and translocation of bacteria, rather than just because you're uh, bypassing or you know, worry about pancreatic secretion. It has to do with decreasing inflammation and really translocation of bacteria, because you're making the intestines happy, because they do need nutrition to kind of keep it healthy. So now I feel that we don't do the jejunal feeding anymore because there's a time that we used to put the peg tube in and then you have another tube going running through uh, to hit the jejunum. And then uh, but I, I don't even have to do that. And definitely uh, we, we also realize nutrition is so important because there's several parvo study dogs where you put an NG tube in them they get better and come out of the hospital faster. And remember, parvos are vomiting, just like pancreatitis case, they're vomiting and having horrible diarrhea, but they found that um, uh, they, it decreases the uh, bacterial translocation. So it makes sense. So I think that's pretty much uh, the, the biggest nugget I learned in the, in the past, like maybe three to five years that, that everyone's talking about, feed, feed, feed that pancreatitis dog. What do you do, how do you go about um, uh, the, the nutrition at home ultimately or when you start offering food? So I, I'm still huge low fat, low protein, and low fiber ideally, um, but ultimately the fat is the, the main one. Remember, the proteins are also stimulations of pancreatic enzyme secretions. I think everyone just forgets about the protein. Uh, in, in fiber, it can delay gastric emptying, uh, so it may prolong the duodenal stimulation. But ultimately, um, I, I, I'm a huge fan of the Hills Low Fat ID. I know that this is the, uh, I forgot to write low fat. Remember, there's regular ID, and there's low fat. And then, uh, then there's the uh, low fat EN now. And then, I don't even think that, do they make you can do below residue anymore? I don't think they kind of phase that out. And then, um, and then the real Canaan GI low fat. And thank goodness, um, that dogs are kind of like easier to get going on their food, but you occasionally have that little foo-foo poodle that has to have like special diet, and those are hard. So those are the home-cooked diets you might have to do to just watch the fat content and such. And, and just remember, if you have an animal that is on a struvite diet, you know, the SO diets, they're super high in fat. If anything, there's a correlation I see a lot where they're coming to me for pancreatitis after being on 
uh, renal uh, struvite you know, dissolution diet. So I'm really kind of picky of which animals I will put them on a struvite diet because I was always taught that you should just increase water intake so the diet's not as critical. And just because you have crystals, it doesn't mean that you're going to, like, prevent stone formation. So, uh, but on the flip side, I have cases where I really need to dissolve that stone because they're not going to go to surgery. So, um, and, and obviously I deal with the UTI first, make sure it's not a struvite trigger by UTI. Um, but either case, just be careful those diets are super high in fat. And then again, you could do a home cooked diet. TPM, PPN, I feel that um, this is definitely an option, you know, but it, it takes uh, a lot more stuff to kind of get through. So I feel like surprisingly NG2 can work great, but occasionally uh, you can go ahead and do the TPN or PPN. The only thing is uh, there's different types. There's lipid base and there, there's non-lipid base. And, um, you know, we haven't done that for a long time because we used to do it because I remember I would buy it from... Um, um, uh, the nutritionist change at Ohio State and they would ship it to us and you have these like it's like bag A, bag B and you squeeze it and it, it f comes together and then that's your, your it's a nice little and then you have to buy some supplementation and you just have to infuse it but now with the E2 for cats and the NG2 for dogs I feel like it's less likely that we have to do it and we do know that NG2 is technically going to be better for the gut right than a, than a, T a TPN or PPN I, I like to tell owners that this may happen again. And sometimes you find out because they just get so much treats and stuff, and this is really a trigger by something that you just need to alter that. If owners are really not going to um, follow suit in that, um, I, I just recommend at least just choose a diet over the counter, look at the fat content, you know, you, and then again, your dog is not a wolf. You don't need to buy the, like the crazy high athletic form, and then it's like you have these like poodle and, it's, and a Maltese. That's just really, you know. Um, so I just feel that uh, um, be careful of the fat content, and a lot of times it is a treat. And obviously, uh, if you truly have hyperlipidemia, you really just need to stick with the low-fat diet. It's going to hit you again over and over again. And so try to do the um, less than 10% fat on dry matter basis. So remember, real canine, low fat's the lowest one, I think. It's like 4.5%. And the low-fat ID, I want to say it's like at 8%. If you want to do home-cooked diets, those are fine. But just uh, that's where we usually use the nutritionist uh, at UT or wherever. So do you usually, like if you see these chanels that are hyperlifting all the time, would you just say, why don't you feed this diet? Oh, yeah, for sure. If you have a schnauzer and you've got pancreatitis. No, I don't mean with pancreatitis. I mean just like your Yeah, forever. Yeah, even if I incidentally stumble on you because I'm like pulling your blood and you're like, oh, my gosh, you're so lipemic, you know. And then there's variations. Like some are crazy high triglycerides and some are just moderate. But it's like, why? You're just like, you're just gambling, you know, because they're just poster child for become diabetic and, you know, pancreatitis. And then assuming they're not... Um, Cushionoid, but I just think it's a great diet, especially if they're willing to eat it. Because think about all the gallbladder mucus seals we see. You know, that's the other complication. So down the road, you're like, you're going to go to surgery at grade 14, even though you've been hyperlipidemic for so long, for like since you were ever, you know, little. So I, I'm a huge fan and trying to give them to the straight dope. And then I have this like fat chart, you know, like look at your dog. This is where he is. <laughs> and then because like, sometimes it's like. Yeah, it's amazing that the education of the owners is like they just not you know that they kill them with kindness with the food and and um, I always tell them they don't have opposable thumbs they're not making their own sandwiches it's whatever they're big it's it's you you know you got to like um, limit calorie intake and I stress that they always tell me oh because but that's what the bag says you know and I said that's the bag that's trying to sell food and, and every metabolism is different you know I can't eat the same as you know my daughter's just all everyone's different and and then I can't stress like as they get older their metabolism slows down you know and and then and then also the richness and we all go through that right like all right what are you can eat in high school is not what we can eat now and they usually go ah oh, you know and then you start talking about the gallbladder in a, in a gesture, and then there's always somebody that, oh, I know so and so that I removed, or they removed it themselves. You know, so I, I think they, once you make that connection, you're, um, you're going to, um, uh, you know, realize, like, oh, you can really help them, you know. Um, but I did have an owner that fired me because she said, that I, she claims that I, her cat was so, so fat and so diabetic and she wouldn't, like, you know, change things. And she claims that I told her she was so fat. Like, the owner was fat. I'm like, why would I even talk about you? I'm talking about your cat. And I think that some people have this, like, hard time, like, you know, because it's just really a sensitive topic for some. 
And, and it's, it's one that I think that the animal really can't, they're so helpless, you know, they're just eating because it's there. And, and, and then also it's amazing how little they know about how much their cat's eating, you know, or dog too. Feline nutrition, uh, high protein, low carb is uh, often the way to go. But the reality is, um, especially if they're big and fat, but I feel that I don't worry about the fat content in cats and I don't really worry about obviously the protein content and it's whatever they will willing to eat. So I just kind of make sure that you kind of stay lean, but it's too hard to put them on a prescription diet they just won't touch it. But there are some cats that really like the uh, DM diet or the MD. And then appetite stimulant, so they're really not committed to say, all right, I'm going to put a feeding tube. Sometimes we will definitely start them on an appetite stimulant pretty quickly. I'm a mirtazapine person. So I used to use Cipraheptine all the time, too. Just remember the hyperexcitability that you always have to warn owners about because always people get freaked out when they start to vulgarize and run around. And if that's the case, I just shave off a little bit more, you know, instead of a quarter tablet. And, and never give diazepam to cats. Remember, that's the one that they will get acute um, hepatic necrosis. Okay. It's very idiosyncratic. And, um, and other supplementations. So you can have um, B12, you know, it's another one. And remember that, uh, that you need an intrinsic factor, okay? So remember how you get B12. When you kind of, uh, you, the B12 gets connected to the intrinsic factor from the pancreas. So you absorb the B12 that's natural in food and it's in the ileum. And then it, and then it goes and the pancreas secretes the intrinsic factor. And together they meet up and that's how you uh, use the, the, the actual B12. And sometimes when they're really decompensating their pancreas, they, they can't make intrinsic factor. And then, um, but dogs, sometimes there's other parts that can make intrinsic factors. So I guess in humans, like, they have a major issue, you know, with that. But, but I, I know that there's other sources. But sometimes when they're so severe, I look at the B12, too. And glucocorticoids, you know, maybe in cats, who knows? I mean, I don't use steroids in my cases. I know we've all done it when you're like, oh, my God, the animal's going to die. You know what we're going to do? They're trying to help with the inflammation. Um, but I, I don't typically use steroids in pancreatitis cases. And then vitamin K, again, they have a very low storage, so they have a low cholestasis. You're going to have to um, help them because they can have uh, coagulation issues from the, the vitamin K issue, the blockage, because it's kind of static flow from cholestasis. And now antioxidants, you know, methionine, milk thistle, vitamin E, selenium, these are all great antioxidants. My concern with that is that your animal's really barely eating. Am I going to cram all these things? Am I going to save your liver? You know, hopefully the pancreatitis settles out. All the liver enzymes goes back to normal. I never had a permanent liver failure. Now, if you have a gallbladder mucosal on top of pancreatitis, you do have underlying liver disease, and that's a different population. Or you have a clangiohep cat, you know. Those are the ones that are like, yeah, they probably can benefit. But I do not try to rush into that. I will say, get over this, start eating, then we can maybe start adding Demerit, you know, if your liver enzymes can't seem to come down because uh, because usually there's something else going on. And heparin, do we really heparinize them? Well, we will if it's a really high uh, uh, coagulability risk, you know, if I have a cushionoid dog, you know, plate, it's our, you know, nine, you know, 900,000, you know you're about to throw a clot somewhere. So that's the other thing. Like, what do they die from? I mean, in our hospital, you know, they're going to respiratory arrest because they get to all that edema in their lungs, um, and, or they will have a stroke. You know, they'll, they have a vascular event in their brain. They're just dead in cage. You know, like their caudal brainstem gets um, stroked out, so then they stop breathing. So and it can happen very quickly. So I feel like if you have an animal that's very, very hypercoagulable, uh, a low molecular weight heparin is the way to go. So I'm not talking about regular heparin. So remember, there's fractionated and unfractionated. So now heparin is, uh, uh, I use Lovenox. And the nice thing about that is that before, you could buy the whole bottle. So it would be like $5,000, okay? And, uh, and it's like a multi-use vial, but it's hard to, you know, uh, get rid of that bottle. So uh, now, it, like Walmart, for example, they will sell um, uh, Lovenox in individual syringes, and, and they come in uh, different concentrations. The same concentration, but different aliquots. You know, like a 0.1 ml, there's a 0.2 ml. I usually try to buy the, the, the biggest volume I can, and they're individual injections. So in humans, you're going to go ahead and inject yourself with it. So it's a spring-loaded injector. So I, I have the owners go pick it up, and then, then I bring it back, and I will put it in a sterile bottle. 
you know, so we have these little like sterile vials, I have a stopper in it, and I just infuse it in there, and now I have my Lobinox. And then I use an insulin syringe so that the owners can give it at home, you know, it's just like insulin. I mean, you know, the amount, because it's a 100 unit per ml concentration of the, um, the, the insulin syringes, you just calculate how many units of um, dosing they get, and usually it's three times a day. And, and it's much reasonable. So each syringe on average like $35. It's come down in price quite a bit. So, so it depends. And, I, and how long do you do it for? If you're really hypercoagulable, at least a week. I wish you could go longer, but sometimes it's not as cost, you know, uh, uh, it's cost prohibitive. Depends on what, how, what the size of the animal is. How do you decide which case to use that on? Are you using uh, no, I don't. I mean, I, th I look at the platelets, you know, if it's super high and, and then you have like, you look like hypercoagulable because you're hypertensive, you have um, uh, really the platelets is a big one. So I'll put them on Plavix too, of course. And, and you maybe you're, you're already doing PTEs. You know, a lot of times they're coming in and their, their respiratory rate is really fast and it's not from pain. And you take radiographs, they look clean, you know, so you know you're probably showering uh, little clots. So those are the ones that are, are, and then I look at the pancreas and like, oh my gosh, it looks horrible. You know, you're you're gonna probably, you're probably that's what's happening. If you if you really want to know, I uh, usually do a D dimer, but the downside, the D dimer, it comes back in like two weeks, and so uh, sometimes it's academic, you know, because it's like, hey, I'm glad we did it, versus you know, you need to keep going, you know. So sometimes we'll have vascular event patients that are coming in. I don't know why you're hypercoagulable, but that you are, and I'll do a diva. I'm already like crazy high, and I'll be putting you on heparin for a while until I sort this out. If you kind of suspect, are you going to hurt them with a the little more? No, 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 you're not. <laughs> but it's just more expense, because sometimes you start to say, all right, but no, you're not going to hurt them. Because the nice thing about low molecular weight heparin is that you're not going to be um, bleeding out. Because back in the days when you use heparin, you had to sit there and do it until their PTs, you know, five times above normal, you know, so you're truly going to bleed, and you're trying to shoot for that. But uh, the the low molecular weight heparin, you should not be um, hyper, or you're not going to bleed spontaneously. So it's good. Um, so like I'll do that for like our Cushing's cases. That's adrenal tumor that I'm going to send to surgery, and I need to like kind of prepare you for this big surgical procedure because you have Cushing's. Um, because a lot of times. Huh? Yeah, I guess that's a great one too, you know, because you guys probably see, you know, certain things. But a lot of times just getting them stabilized will be all right, but, but just think about all your hypercoagulable diseases. The low molecular weight heparins could be great. Prognosis is variable, of course, it depends on the, 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 the what spectrum you are. And really, clinical response is the best predictor, but there are some uh, negative prognostic indicators that will go over. But uh, lean animals tend to do better than obese. Uh, I suspect it's kind of like I was explaining to the owner, you're kind of fueling the fire. There's just a lot of, you know, fat that is just digesting and, and all that necrosis. You get a lot of uh, fat necrosis. Um, and then you can have recurrence again. And then watch for the transient diabetic. So a lot of these guys, once the pancreatitis goes away, the, the cat no longer needs insulin. So if I have that kind of transient one, I'll say, hey, you probably should, well, I always send cats with glucometers home. I like that a lot because they let them do the curve and you, you know, then come back in. And for some reason, they, they can't, um, at least minimally, they can um, do uh, collect urine. You could get Nozorb or use like uh, fish tank pebbles just to collect some of urine to look for glucose in the urine. If it's negative, you probably say, hey, you're running negative at home and you're a diabetic. You shouldn't ever be true negative for you know, a diabetic. Usually there's still some glucose. And then it starts giving me a heads up that maybe you're starting to go low, you know. And then a lot of them, they will develop EPI. I have a handful of them that do great, recovered, like six months later, diarrhea is happening, and you're trying to work that out, and the next thing you know, it's an EPI case. So, so I think I suspect it's just scarring down, and then, then you know, they can't make the digestive enzymes. There's been several papers that kind of help out with like negative prognostic indicators, and that's of course you know shock. They're really hypertensive. They're starting to shut down their kidneys, uh, and obviously the ictric animal is going to be a little bit tougher. I feel like cats, if it's fatty liver, it's very reversible, but I feel like a dog that's ictric, I get more nervous with, it, with their pancreatitis, and then um, definitely um, hypocalcemia. But again, usually it's because they're hypoalbuminemic, and there's definitely a negative prognostic indicator which makes sense. If you're really bad vasculitis, you're losing albumin, and these are the ones that are effusing. 
And then obviously when you're, you can't keep your sugar up, that's also a concern. Are you going septic? And then we talked about hypoproteinemia. And if, even if you're not, uh, if I'm trying to be very money conscious with the owner, I will try to just do PCV total solids. You look at your total solid, but realize, you know, it'd be nice to just do an albumin. That's what you're monitoring. Um, but the hepatic lipidosis cats, uh, they really do need a feeding tube because if you don't treat that, it's going to be impossible to reverse them, get them out. And of course, the effusion. The bicavitary effusion are the worst because you go into respiratory distress. And then a falling hematocrit, and then um, push, you go into DIC. You're starting to like bleed out everywhere. And then the melana, the gut starts to slough. And it's just pretty bad. So we didn't take a break, so if there's any questions, and you guys are free to go, okay? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.